All right, we're in Luke chapter 22, as we're studying through the Gospel of Luke here on Sunday morning. And this is our second part. We're going to read the first, well, let's see, we're picking it up in verse 7. And then we're going to read down through verse 13, but we'll get farther than that. But I want to go just that far before we pray. It goes like this. Then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. So Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and prepare the Passover for us that we may eat it. They said to him, where will you have us prepare it? He said to them, behold, when you have entered the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him into the house that he enters and tell the master of the house, the teacher says to you, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room furnished, prepare it there. And they went and found it just as he had told them and they prepared the Passover. Let's just stop there for a bit, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we always pause whenever we dig into your word because we know that it is through the power of the Holy Spirit that we are awakened to an understanding of what your word has to say. Lord, you make it make sense. And we pray that you do that today. And we also pray that you'd help us to apply your word to our lives. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. This section of Luke that we're looking at here thus far begins uh, with the saying, then came the day of unleavened bread. So this would have been the 14th day of the month of Nisan. This was the day according to Exodus chapter 12 when the nation of Israel was to observe the Passover. And it was on this day that the people of Israel would begin to e eat uh, uh, unleavened bread, uh, and on the very afternoon of this day, from about 2.30 to 5.30, uh, they would sacrifice the Passover lamb. And uh, that evening, they would gather in their homes or wherever the families would come together, some sort of a suitable place, and they would observe the whole Passover uh, meal which of course was a reminder of God's deliverance uh, for, of the people of Israel from their bondage uh, in, in Egypt. And of course, you remember at sundown, it would start a new day. We, we forget this sometimes. Uh, in the Jewish reckoning of time, sundown was the end of that day and, and the beginning of a new day. Uh, so anyway, it is, it is now the day when the Passover lamb is sacrificed and the evening meal is taking place. So Jesus told Peter and John to go and prepare a place. And they said, well, where do you, would you like us to do that? Because remember, Jesus had no home in which to live at this time in his life. And so he told them to go into the city and look for a man who was carrying a water jar. And you might think to yourself, well, that's a strange thing to look for because wouldn't there be a lot of people carrying, you know, potentially water jars? Well, the answer is no, because women carried water jars. Now, that was not something that the men typically did. And so to see this would have been a rather uncommon sight. And so they were to see this thing and they were then to follow the man. And I love this. He tells them, just go right into the house wherever he goes. You know, you and I would call that trespassing, but I guess it's cool, you know, sort of a thing. And so they follow him right in and they are to, you know, search out the master of the house and say, you know, where can uh, the teacher uh, prepare Passover and the, he says you will be shown this upper room where you will go you'll find everything all set up for such a thing and it is there you are to prepare uh, the meal and so they were to then have Passover now it's at this point that I feel like we need to pause for just a moment and take in this very strange picture that is given to us here in the word of God about these men gathering to observe Passover hours before the fulfillment of Passover takes place with the very man who is the fulfillment of Passover. The Passover lamb is sitting among them. And yet they're observing these rituals and traditions that go along with the traditional Passover observance and here is Jesus sitting in their midst <laughs> and I think they were oblivious. They came to understand it later. There was a lot of things they were oblivious about. We'll actually 
talk about that more next week. But it goes on in verse 14, if you look with me in your Bible, to say that when the hour came, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And I think most of you know that they sat at tables that were very low to the ground at that time, and they would usually lean on their left elbow, and they would stretch out their legs away from the table and then use their right hand to eat, you know. And so this is the traditional way of the Jews reclined at the table and and they sit on cushions. And Jesus begins to speak to them here. And I want you to take note of what he says to them here in verse 15, because it's very significant. He says, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Of God, And these are good words to pause over for just a moment because whenever we're dealing with the issue of fulfillment, uh, there, there are some great pictures and insights for us to see. And he says here, I've earnestly desired, earnestly desired. The Greek word here that is translated earnestly in the English refers to a passionate longing. I have passionately longed to spend this Passover, this last Passover with you. And this is the opportunity that Jesus is taking now because he is just hours away from being sentenced and crucified. And he wants very much to use this final time to connect the dots for his disciples. Between all the things that are happening here, all the things that have happened related to his ministry, and all the things that Passover signifies with what is about to take place. And so in order to bring it all together, we're told in verse 17, again in your Bible, it says, and he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Now, this was the cup which Jesus raised as part of the original Passover. I'm just gonna tell you here, Jesus is observing Passover with his disciples, but in just a moment here, he's gonna move from Passover to the Last Supper. And, and everything up to this point, the, 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 the disciples would have recognized as part of the traditional Passover celebration. But in just a moment, Jesus is going to finish out the traditional Passover, and he's going to move into what we call the Last Supper, and this, is, this probably raised a few eyebrows of the disciples in the room. As I said, they were used to Passover celebrations. But now Jesus is going to take this in a completely different way and he's going to reveal to them that this is all about him. That, this, that all of this observance and all of this tradition and all of this ritual points to him. But at this point, he's, he's, he's raising a cup, and, and this is one of four cups, actually, that is raised during the traditional Passover celebration. And so he raises the cup, and he says, I've, I, I want you to all partake of this, and this is important, but I want you to know this, I won't drink again of this. I'm not going to drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom comes. And what he's basically saying here is that until the fulfillment of these things comes to pass, Jesus will not partake again of that cup until the marriage supper of the Lamb. And that is a term that is given to us in the scripture, particularly in the book of Revelation, where we hear about this taking place. And I want you to show you this on the screen from Revelation 19. Check it out here. John writes, then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude. It was like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder crying out, hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory. Look at this, for the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride, and that is the church, has made herself ready. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. And so here we see in this chapter of Revelation, this reference to the marriage supper of the Lamb when Jesus will once again raise the cup with his bride in the celebration of this coming together. And, and he, uh, he, he, uh, 
speaks of this as a future event in the final fulfillment uh, of God's redemptive uh, plan. So as we read on here now, beginning in verse 19, this is where I was telling you Jesus is going to change, switch gears, if you will, a little bit. And going from Passover to what we call the Last Supper. And now he begins to apply these elements, the same bread and the same cup that had been applied in the Passover now, he begins to apply to himself. And you'll notice he begins in verse 19, and it says, and he took bread, <clears throat> and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is my body, which is given for you, do this in remembrance of me. And, and I, most of you, I'm sure, have Probably even all of you have gone through a communion service. You've heard us repeat those words. And we know that Jesus began the Last Supper, at this part of that Last Supper, with showing uh, the bread as a symbol of his body. What we don't often realize is the significance of the body of Christ in bearing our sin. And I think about the disciples during this night, and again, how clueless they were about all these things. They, they were used to Passover, but now Jesus is saying things that don't seem to make sense. He, he, he takes this bread, and he gives thanks, and he breaks it in front of them, and he says, this is my body. And they had to have been wondering, what? What do you mean by that? But of course they would come to understand the fullness of what Jesus was saying and Peter would actually go on to write about the significance of the body of Jesus in the whole concept of bearing our sin. Let me put this on the screen for you. From 1 Peter chapter two, Peter writes, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, meaning the cross, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. And then those beautiful words quoted from the Old Testament by his wounds. You have been healed. You know, we've been healed of this sinful condition uh, that uh, sentenced us to death. And then the writer of Hebrews also makes reference here uh, to the body of Christ when he says, when Christ came into the world, he said, sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but look at this, a body have you prepared for me? Then I said, behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. And by that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And then the body, uh, concerning the body of Jesus, uh, there's this statement, beautiful statement made by the Apostle Paul in his second letter to the Corinthians where he says, for our sake, he, God the Father, made him, Jesus Christ, to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And I read that verse to you, but I confess to you at the same time, I don't understand it. I really don't. I mean, I understand the standpoint of someone standing in for me and taking my penalty, I, I get that. I know what it's like for somebody to step forward and say, you can punish me, not them. That's all good and fine. I don't understand how Jesus was made sin. I don't get that. But it was, it was a reality. And he became sin to the point where the father had to then look away. The father could not even abide the sight of the son and darkness fell upon the land and Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? For the very first time in eternity, a separation between the eternal Father and the eternal Son took place because Jesus was made sin for you and I. Blows my mind. So, then we have this statement concerning the cup. Look at verse 20 in your Bible. And likewise the cup after they had eaten, saying, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. I'm very happy to tell you today, Christians, that we are under a new covenant. It is not the old covenant. There was an old covenant. The last old covenant that the Bible refers to is the Mosaic covenant covenant 
that God made with Israel through Moses, right? But that's not the covenant you and I are under. As much as for the last 2,000 years, Christians have been trying to cram parts of the old covenant into the new covenant, it's not our covenant. They are very different covenants, as a matter of fact. And the new covenant is symbolized during the Last Supper in this cup. Jesus raises the cup. And of course, the cup being the symbol of his blood, he says, this is the cup of the new covenant. And we understand that blood plays a very significant role in covenants throughout the course of the Bible. And this is given to us throughout the word of God. Let me show you some passages from Hebrews, beginning in Hebrews chapter nine, verse 18, where it says, therefore not even the first covenant was inaugurated without blood. For when every commandment of the law had been declared by Moses to all the people, he took the blood of, in this case, calves and goats, with water and scarlet wool and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, this is the blood of the covenant that God commanded for you. Notice the similarity of language between how Moses declared the blood of the covenant under the old covenant with what Jesus declared at the Last Supper, although it's a new covenant. And then in Hebrews 9.22, he goes on to say, indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. In fact, he goes on to say that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. There can't be forgiveness of sins without the shedding of blood. Why? because the wages of sin is death. There must be a death. There must be the shedding of blood. And the shedding of blood is that symbol, if you will, of the giving of life. Because it, it, the blood is, it, well, we call it our life blood for a very good reason, right? Without it, you're not alive. <clears throat> and then finally, as we look at verses 11 and 12, it says, when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, even through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing our eternal redemption. I absolutely love the book of Hebrews because it so beautifully ties the, 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 the string, that golden string uh, of reasoning between the uh, ceremonies of the Old Testament and the things that happen, particularly at Passover and the Day of Atonement, and brings it into the New Testament to help us to understand how God was foretelling, if you will, the coming of Jesus and the work that he would accomplish on the cross for us. And he says here that Jesus, unlike the high priests of the Old Testament, Jesus didn't go into a man-made structure to pour out the blood of a goat or a, a lamb or something like that. He went into a, 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 a structure, if you will, heaven not made with human hands and poured out his own blood upon the mercy seat of God, thus uh, securing our eternal uh, redemption. Cool, huh? I mean, the blood of Jesus and, and how these things, I'm sure, again, for the disciples were just kind of a fog, you know. I mean, they understood the blood from the standpoint of the Old Testament, but, but connecting all of the dots uh, into what Jesus was about to do on the cross here. I'm sure this came uh, progressively. But Jesus takes this cup now, again, the symbol of the blood, and he speaks of the new covenant. This is the blood of the new covenant. And one of my favorite passages in the whole Bible is one of the most beautiful and I think powerful prophetic passages, which speaks of the new covenant given to us in Jeremiah chapter 31. And I love it because it's so beautiful. Look what it says. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Don't let that weird you out that God says he's gonna make the covenant with Israel and Judah, and it doesn't mention the church there. The church isn't mentioned in the Old Testament, first off. And second of all, we are grafted in to the vine, remember? Gentiles are grafted in, right? Actually contrary to nature. So that's why the, the whole concept of the covenant is initially and always originally spoken to Israel. So God says, I'm gonna make a new covenant with them. But I want you to notice the next words, they're so important. He says uh, that it will not be like the covenant that I made 
with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. So we know exactly what covenant he's talking about. He's talking about the Mosaic covenant. He says, it's not gonna be like that covenant, okay? He says, it's a covenant, my covenant that they broke, though I was a husband, declares the Lord. And then he goes on to describe how the covenant will be. He says, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. And then he starts this way. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts. And this people right there, I, I, we're gonna keep this passage up for a bit. This right here is one of the most beautiful passages in the Bible because it prophetically foretells the coming of the Holy Spirit to indwell the believer. He's talking about for those who put their faith in Jesus, how they receive the Holy Spirit, and through the Spirit, God then begins to write his law and his word upon our hearts so that it is no longer external to us, it is internal. What a beautiful picture. And he goes on to say, if you look with me on the screen, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people, and no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each uh, his brother saying, know the Lord for they shall all know me from the least of them to, for, to the greatest declares the Lord. Stop there for a moment. I remember reading this passage once and thinking, oh, I don't think teachers are gonna be involved in the New Testament church because it says right there, no longer will a man teach his neighbor saying, know the Lord. But this passage isn't saying that teachers aren't necessary under the new covenant because actually we see in Ephesians chapter four that, Ephesian, that, that Paul says teachers are a gift to the church along with apostles, prophets, evangelists, and so forth. Um, what he is saying here is that there is an intimate knowing of God that cannot be taught by any human teacher and that is a work that the Holy Spirit will accomplish when the Spirit comes to indwell believers. You see, as a Bible teacher myself, I can teach you about God, I can teach you about the Bible, but I cannot teach you how to know the Lord. That's not possible. It's, it's, it's something no human teacher can impart. Only the Holy Spirit can impart that kind of experiential, intimate knowing. What's interesting, and you've probably heard this before, but this statement here from this passage in Hebrew, in, in Jeremiah rather, the, the Hebrew word that says that they will know the Lord, it's the same Hebrew word that is used to describe intimate sexual relations between a man and a woman. Now there is no sexual connotation going on in this passage, but the intimacy of the word is still very much involved in the understanding of what it is to know the Lord. This is not an intellectual uh, academic knowing. This is an intimate experiential knowing, okay? This is, this is not something you learn in a book and, and pass on a quiz. So what God is saying here is that when the coming of the Holy Spirit takes place under the new covenant, they will know me intimately, personally, experientially, right? And no teacher can impart that, right? And then the last part of this passage is so beautiful. He says, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. Wow. Of course, that's, you know, beautifully wraps up a description of the new covenant, doesn't it? I will, God says, I will forgive them. I am gonna forgive them of all of their sins. You know, I was reading a passage just this last week in my own Bible time in the book of Micah, and I, I, I happened upon this, Micah 7:19. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. Isn't that beautiful? So, you know, Corey Tenboom used to say in her book, so don't go fishing. <laughs> don't go fishing where God has taken your sin and cast it into the depths of the sea. And don't let the enemy dredge it up either because he likes to do that. 
but you know that your iniquities have been trodden underfoot. And the Lord says, I choose to remember them no more. And that is such a beautiful, beautiful sentiment. So we see this picture, you know, in the Old Testament of this new covenant that Jesus is now inaugurating here at the Last Supper when he lifts the cup and he says, this is the cup of the new covenant that is established or ratified, if you will, in my blood. You know, whenever we're talking about the Lord's Supper, one of the key passages that we usually focus on is one that's actually given to us, not in the Gospels, but in one of the epistles, and that's in Paul's letter to the Corinthians. Again, on the screen here from 1 Corinthians 11, Paul wrote this, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night uh, when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as, as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So we're gonna leave this up on the screen for just a moment because I wanna bring out a couple of things from this passage, a couple of primary messages that I think are really important for us to see here in the observance of the Lord's Supper. First of all, it is the words that Paul quotes Jesus as saying, and that is, do this in remembrance of me, remembrance. Communion is meant to be a memorial. And we all know what a memorial is. When you go to a memorial, when someone has passed away, you get together with other people, friends and family, to remember, to remember that person. And the memorial that Jesus is encouraging us to do is a reminder and a remembrance of what he did for us when he gave his life on the cross uh, for our sins. And remembering the cross is something we very much need to do because the whole gospel is founded on it. And if we get away from the cross, we get away from the gospel. And, it's, and people, you, you might think, well, who's gonna get away from the cross? Oh, let me tell you. How many times in the history of Christianity we have deviated from the cross? The cross must remain central. And I'm not talking about a symbol of a cross. I'm talking about the fundamental embrace of what Jesus accomplished for us on the cross. It must remain central to all of our theology or the gospel literally crumbles uh, in our hands. So he, he says, do this. And, and then he also says, do this in remembrance of me. And that's the other thing, you know, there, there, there seems to be this tendency among human beings, particularly religious ones, and I think you know what I mean by that, to, to get away from the person of Jesus Christ, to somehow lose sight of the centrality of Jesus Christ. And we get involved in all kinds of religious irrelevant details, you know, which I, to me is kind of the definition of religion. It's, it's the things that, are irrelevant, but, but, but we just, again, we have this uncanny tendency to forget about Jesus. You know, I was telling uh, the uh, kids in our senior high, high school uh, group that I meet with twice a week for a Bible study, I, I tell them regularly, guys, when you, when you get into conversations with people who are asking you about your faith or asking you about the Bible or, or something related to that, I, I keep telling them, keep it on point. Keep talk, don't, don't let them talk about anything but Jesus. And they're gonna ask you all kinds of questions. Yeah, well, what about, and they're gonna ask you things there's, that, that you don't know, and frankly, they don't know either. But they're gonna do it to deflect the importance of what really needs to be discussed. So it's important to come back and just say, well, I don't really know the answer to that question, but let me, let me tell you what Jesus said, right? Let me tell you what he said. And let's keep the conversation on him because he is the focal point. We don't have a religion per se. We have a relationship with a person. We're, we, we're, we're, not, we're not putting our hope in theology or doctrine. We're putting our hope in a person, you see. It, it's a very personal sort of a thing. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. 
Me, it's very personal, right? Jesus is very personal. He needs to be very personal. And so we're not talking about religion right now. You know, we're talking about a person. And um, the second reason for the observance of communion that is given by the Apostle Paul in that passage that we still have up on the screen is this statement where he says, as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Now, that's another interesting phrase, isn't it? Do you know that that word proclaim is used most often in the New Testament to describe the, 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 the telling of the gospel to unbelievers. It's not something we proclaim amongst ourselves. You don't really need to proclaim the gospel to people who've already embraced it. To proclaim means to announce. And so he's saying that in communion and by communion, we make a proclamation of the death of the Lord and what he accomplished on the cross until he returns. And we're to do this right up until the Lord comes for us. We're to continue to faithfully proclaim his death and the work that he accomplished uh, on the cross. Um, one other, I, I think, interesting point that I wanna make that amidst all the instructions we have about the Last Supper, which Jesus, you know, we're seeing here in Luke 22 is, 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 is doing with his, his disciples. And among all the information we have from the Word of God related to that, have you ever noticed that there's not one single word given in the Scripture about the requirement of a minister or a priest as the only ones who are allowed to serve the communion elements? Have you ever noticed that? Where did that come from? That's called religion. That's man-made religion. The, 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 the characterization of man-made religion is we come up with rules. You gotta keep them. And we make rules and we say, well, here's the deal. There are special people, and you're not one of them. <laughs> and only these special people can do this or do that or whatever, where in the world did we come up with that? Because it's not in the Bible. Communion is meant to be a simple memorial for believers and we gather, however we may gather, with whomever we may gather, we do so to remind ourselves of the power of the cross and the work he accomplished that we never could. And it can be done with anybody. Uh, you may think it irreverent, but I used to be on staff with a guy, a pastor up in Washington State, and he loved communion. I, I, I told some of you guys this before, but um, he, he just loved doing it with his kids. His kids are all grown now, but he's, he, you know, they'd be having pizza and pop, and he'd say, come on guys, let's do communion. He didn't have to have special kind of bread or, or, or special kind of drink. It didn't matter. He didn't care because he knew that it wasn't about that. It was about Jesus. It was about remembering Jesus. And so he'd take off, he'd grab some of the pizza and he'd you know, give it to his kids. Here, we're going to do communion. Remember the body of the Lord and here, take your Coke. And you, again, you might think, well, that sounds really, but you know what? Who cares? It's about Jesus. It's about him. You know, if you're using water, who cares? You're remembering Jesus, <laughs> and that's the point, right? We, we have this great way of missing the point and getting all involved in all these details. It's gotta be done just right, <laughs> you know, or we're gonna, I don't know, he might just send us to hell or something, you know, stupid, you know? It's like, come on, do this in remembrance of me. The last few verses that we're gonna be looking at here this morning, verses 21, 22, and 23, and then we'll close with these. It says, but behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table. For the Son of Man goes as it has been determined, but woe to the man by whom he is betrayed. And they began to question one another which of them it could be who was going to do this. And so we, we end with this statement related to the person of Judas, we know that Judas is the man who did that horrible thing of betraying the Lord into those who captured him apart from the crowds. And, and Jesus said, uh, he pronounced, you'll notice a woe upon the man who did such a thing. The word woe means 
great sorrow and distress. And it is horrible. And we are reminded of that here, but we're also reminded of something else that I wanna leave you with. And that is the statement that Jesus makes here, where he says, the Son of Man goes as it has been determined. Very important statement, because it reminds us that there is a sovereignty in, in connection with all of these events from the purpose and the plan of the Lord to accomplish what he determined to accomplish. And that is the beautiful thing. One of the, one of the, one of the reasons I love teaching through the Old Testament on Wednesday evening is because we're able to see the, the, the redemptive plan of God in, in, as early as in Genesis. And then we see it pictured for us through the so many types and shadows foretelling the coming of Christ and accomplishing his work on the cross through the Old Testament. And then we start reading these prophecies that give us specific information like how he would be crucified, how he would literally have his hands pierced Right? We, we read the specific details of crucifixion in the Old Testament and we see the beauty and what we are left with is the understanding that God had this thing planned from the very beginning. That he knew, he knew that you and I would sin. He knew that we would never be able to attain the standard of righteousness that was established. He knew, and knowing that, uh, the wages of sin is death, he knew that he would send his son to become a man and to bear your penalty and mine for us. He knew, he had it planned. And his sovereign redemptive program is seen throughout the course of scripture, through the whole of scripture, and it's a beautiful picture. Regardless of the difficulties that we see in some of the specifics like Judas, this man who rose up to betray Jesus, Again, even in the midst of that, we see that God had a plan and it went exactly as God determined. And the reason I bring that out specifically is not just that you would see the beauty of it, but that you would embrace that same understanding in your own life. And that you would know and understand that God has a plan for your life as well. And it may sound trite, but it's true. God has a purpose. Even in the difficulties you've been experiencing, even in the pain, even in the problems, even in the tribulations. God has a purpose, God has a plan. There's a sovereign thread of purpose that runs through the course of your life and mine, regardless of what we may be enduring. And the Bible gives you and I the wonderful promise that he is going to work all of those things together for his good according to his purpose, according to his plan, and according to his great love for you. So those are some wonderful promises to lay hold of. 